This evening, uh, I'm happy to welcome you to the eighth presentation. I'm going to introduce here the president of Tour Imagination, Audrey Voth Petko. My name is Sandra Reimer, and I work with Tour Imagination on the communication. But Audrey, as the president of Tour Imagination, has the honor of introducing our presenter this evening. So, Audrey, go good ahead. evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our final webinar on our Anabaptist Story Lives On Virtual Museum and Archive Tours. Haven't we experienced a wonderfully informative succession of excellent tours rich in Anabaptist and Mennonite history? Thank you for joining us, and so many of you have joined almost all of them. We have had such excellent responses from all of you with suggestions of other museums, archives, and libraries that we are considering another series, perhaps in the fall. So keep checking Tour Imagination's website for future updates. But tonight's presenter is Lorreen harding Giesing. Lorreen is the archivist librarian at Conrad Grable University College in Waterloo, Ontario. Prior to her arrival at Conrad Grable in 2009, Lorene worked as a freelance public historian writing histories for Ontario Mennonite organizations. She also managed an audiovisual library resourcing Mennonite churches. Her hometown is the farming community of Vineland, Ontario, an area rich in Mennonite history. During her undergraduate years, she lived and studied at Conrad Grable. She has a degree in history and master's degrees in religion and culture and the library and archival sciences. She is the current president of the Mennonite Historical Society of Canada. Lorene has recently been named as co-author of a forthcoming book on the history of Mennonites in Canada from 1970 to the present. She lives in Kitchener, Ontario with her husband and two children and loves to travel and garden. Welcome, Lorreen. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you, Audrey. Good evening, everyone. I'm coming to you today from my home in downtown Kitchener, Ontario. My window is open, so if you hear sounds of the street, that's just the city doing what cities do. Um, but hopefully you'll still be able to hear me and everything comes through okay. Now, in all of these types of meetings, we've been able to peer into each other's homes and there's always a moment where we get distracted by what's in the background. So I'll just say that um, this painting behind me, for which you can see part of, was painted by a local artist right here in uh, my neighborhood. So um, we enjoy having uh, a lot of artists here in our area and uh, it's great to have their work on our walls. And I think as a Mennonite, uh, this kind of, and as someone with rural roots, this, uh, I love waking up to this in the morning and it reminds me of, of uh, my rural roots in many ways. So I'm gonna share some slides with you now. Just give me a minute to get that started. We're all getting used now to doing things virtually and uh, these are some of the ways that uh, we reach out virtually at the Mennonite Archives of Ontario. Um, we have our website, of course, the Mennonite Archives of Ontario, which has a lot of our archival descriptions and um, a lot of other information, including a genealogy guide, a guide to doing peace research at our archives and so on. We have an Instagram account, which we have a lot of fun with, mostly trying to dispel the mysteries behind archival and library work. You can find that on Instagram at grable.library.archives. And we are part of MADE. I'm sure you've heard uh, lots about MADE already. All of our photographs are on MADE and many of our archival descriptions are starting to be on MADE. If you were to come to our building, this is what it would look like. We're at Conrad Grable University College on the University of Waterloo campus. Um, the library and, arch and archives occupies the 
what, what you see there is the second floor uh, of that, uh, that kind of metallic um, building and it extends onto the, the third floor, the top floor of that brick building beside it. So we have quite a large and roomy and bright space and the archives, the vault itself, is, is a building within a building. It sits in the center of that um, metallic looking building. So um, that's where we hide all our treasures. This is me in our processing room with one of our donors. I'm just going over with him some of his family materials that he brought in. Um, it's always one of the favorite parts of my job to hear the stories of families and individuals and congregations and figure out how best to describe them so that others can have access to them. And this is just a look into our um, archives reading room, which is located within the library. And here I'm talking to a class. I'm actually holding the oldest uh, item in our archives, which is a pamphlet, uh, Reformation pamphlet from, from 1520. So I chose the topic family trees tonight. Why did I do that? When I started at the archives 11 years ago now, there was a large print of the Daniel and Maria Steiner family tree from Ohio outside of my office. I didn't put it there. It was just there when I arrived. It was a very large print, maybe two by three feet. And what you see here is a detail from that print. And what I noticed is that as people walked by my office and they may have absolutely no connection to the family, they might know nothing about Mennonites, but they would stop and look at the tree, try to trace the lines, try to imagine the lives of these people. And it just kind of proved to me again and again how fascinating family trees are to people and how they can really um, pull at their imaginations. And so I said at that point, um, someday I will do a, uh, an exhibit that will show the rest of the family trees in the archives to the world. And that exhibit is currently up in our building, which is unfortunately closed right now, but I will share with you some of the pieces from that exhibit. The exhibit is called Growing Family design and desire in uh, Mennonite genealogy. And I'll say more in a little bit about what I mean by design and desire. We're also going to look at three different family trees over the next few minutes. One is a Russian Mennonite family tree, one is a Swiss Mennonite family tree, and one is an Amish Mennonite family tree, and they're all very different. So let's get started. And as you can see from this very first image, doesn't look much like a tree at all. Um, this is the uh, family chart of a man named Johann Jansen, or Hans Jansen, as it says in the very middle there. And it was done by his great, great, great grandson, a man named Abraham Epp, who lived in the Niagara region in the 1940s and 1950s. And what Abraham did is he took his uh, Prussian Mennonite ancestor, Hans Jansen, and his two wives, Egonita Fast and Maria Bergman, and put them in the center and put the, the uh, descendants to the outside. So it's a very unusual kind of chart. And it's amazing how many of them he was able to cram in there. I'll give you a closer look now. This is what the center of the chart looks like with Johan and his children with uh, Maria around the outside. Um, uh, he and Agatha were, were childless together. So Hans Janssen started out in Prussia and was the first of his family to emigrate to um, Imperial Russia, now Ukraine, and the people, his descendants who occupy the outside of this rectangle are all, as much as I can tell, in Canada. So this chart represents migration through 
two countries and a family still connected despite that migration. So Abraham made obviously an interesting choice in how he depicted his family. And when it comes to family trees, I like to talk about these two words, design and desire. Design because each family tree maker makes decisions about how they will place, how they will describe the family information. And desire because each family tree maker has a motivation. Why do they do it? What kind of statement are they trying to make? They must have some kind of deep motivation, I figure, or why would they go to all of this painstaking work? In this image, there are clues to both Abraham's design and his desire. He places his immigrant ancestor at the center, but as I said before, there's also immigrants around the edges. By the way, I might add on a personal note, um, my family is on here as well. We are connected here. So why did he do this? Why did he feel that he wanted to connect um, these people so directly? And I think these two migrations had something to do with it. He wanted these people to know that across time and space, they were all still connected. I'll tell you a funny little story about this tree. As I mentioned, it, it's part of my family tree and my aunt and uncle who are married to each other came in one day and looked at it and they each found their names on this tree. This will not be a surprise to many Mennonites that we are often related to each other in many different ways. Um, but we kind of joke about that, but it's actually one of the most common things in the world. Um, there is no mathematical way that all of us could have absolutely unique ancestry. We are all related to each other in more than one way. Um, the, the term for this is pedigree collapse, which is, I think, an, an, interesting, um, an interesting term that you, you might want to use, drop in conversation someday, pedigree collapse. So I don't know if any of you have experienced family trees of this kind with an ancestor at the center working out. This was the first time I had actually seen it. Um, and it, it might look strange for the most part, but for um, most of history, the thing we know is the family tree would have been very unusual to most people. Let me show you what I mean. So in the ancient Roman world, if you were depicting your family in pictorial form, you would put your ancestors at the top. That's the place furthest away chronologically from you. And it's also the place of greatest reverence, the top of an image. But this became a problem for people trying to depict Jesus' family tree. Can you think why? How do you put Jesus, the most revered person in the tree, uh, at the bottom? Jesus is a descendant, but he's also the most revered. So illustrators looked to the idea of the Jesse tree, uh, Jesse, father of David in the Old Testament, and they inverted this image, placing Jesse at the bottom and from the root of Jesse, from the stump of Jesse, out comes um, the various descendants of Jesse and David. And then we finally have, uh, as you can see here, Jesus and Mary at the top. And this is a very common image. Some of you may, might be familiar with the Jesse tree already, but we, you might not be familiar with the idea of how different this was um, from, from family depictions in the rest of the ancient world. And it's the roots of what we now know of as the family tree. So the other thing about a tree is that we get the image of upward movement and growth. It's not just that you're relying on your ancestor being the best and you are just great by being connected to them. 
your ancestors provide the growth and flourishing which you now experience. So it's actually a very optimistic image and, and one that is very suited to the modern world where we like to think a lot about growth and, ex and expansion. So here is a family tree from our archives that is more typical. Uh, this is a woman named Sibylla Bauman in the 1950s. She didn't make the tree, but she had it commissioned. This is the family tree of Isaac Cressman and his two uh, successive wives, Barbara and Elizabeth. And by the way, Barbara and Elizabeth were, were sisters as well as being the successive wives of, of Isaac Cressman. On each one of these tiny little branches in this tree is, is a name from um, the early 1800s all the way through to the 1960s. And uh, Sibylla is standing at a family reunion and she's standing on the farm where the family settled coming up from Pennsylvania to Waterloo Region uh, in, along the banks of the Grand River. Here is an image, that same image, but in color. And I apologize, I was not able to get into the archives to get a, a better image than this, but I think it, it gives you the, uh, the idea here of what it looks like. The tree has Psalm 1 verse 3 along the bottom. I'll read the whole verse. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. So again, this idea of prospering, of, of flourishing is very important. I also find it interesting how some of these family trees are depicted not only on a very specific location, often a settler location, but they might even have some farm buildings depicted. They're, they're very specific in their location, which is interesting because for settler families, their roots are elsewhere. They're not actually in the ground um, where they are, uh, where, they have, where they have settled. This is also interesting to think about today when we know so much more about the history of Indigenous peoples in North America and uh, the role of colonists in, um, in changing their lives uh, in unbelievable ways. And so I wonder if we would create family trees uh, in quite the same way. How would we depict our, our, our roots um, on the land? That would be, I think, an interesting uh, question for family tree makers to explore. Here's another close-up example of that Cressman family tree. Just showing again the, the interconnection of uh, sisters and brothers and cousins and aunts and uncles across generations. And you'll notice too how uh, the artist had to bend the branches and bring branches up to sort of fill in the gaps. Uh, as much as we like to think of uh, families is kind of naturally forming a tree. Sometimes, uh, you know, it, uh, it doesn't quite work out in tree shape, but we, we family tree makers really, really try to, to get that shape of the tree in there. Even if we, um, we did it more precisely, it, it might not even look so much like a tree. So part of what I'm saying here is that every depiction of our family, um, that there's some kind of values that, that are at work here. Um, some of you may have done an Anantoffel chart. It simply means ancestor chart. Um, and it's a very basic, uh, you yourself usually um, started off and then your parents and then all of your ancestors previously to that. So it puts the individual at the top or at the center. Um, this kind of chart became very popular at the turn of the last century in the, in the early 1900s when people were really thinking about exploring their mental and physical health from the perspective of their ancestors. And unfortunately, it, it got tangled up in, in eugenics thinking for a while. Um, but the Anatopal chart is still used today and it's still useful uh, in different ways. But it does, it does come with a value system. 
some of you may have done more emotional explorations of your family uh, through a genogram or there's all kinds of emotional mapping tools out there that can be used. So this is not just stating how you are related by blood to people, but how you are related to emotionally to people in your family. One of uh, the, the most interesting ex examples, places where I find genograms is in um, pastor's archives. Often if they went to seminary, they had some kind of uh, training in family therapy and that often required them to do some kind of thinking about their place in their own family. And that's when these kinds of charts would, would tend to be used. So the third family tree I want to share with you today is uh, an Amish Mennonite family tree, Brenneman family tree. And this is a picture from the 1940s. And you can see hanging on the wall of the barn there at a family reunion, um, a tree done by a teenager named Lorraine Roth. That name might be familiar to some of you, especially in Amish Mennonite uh, history. Um, she spent a lifetime following, uh, bringing together Amish Mennonite families through, through genealogy, tracking them through Europe. Uh, she had all kinds of great stories about that. But this is her first attempt, and it's on a window blind. I guess, you know, being Amish Mennonite, very economical, found the window blind um, and uh, was able to paint a tree on it. She also, uh, caused a bit of a sensation in the family because she, through her research, realized that the name of her great-great-grandmother um, that her great-grandfather had given her was wrong. Um, and in fact, the, the, the person who was her great-grandmother, here's a, the tree in, in color, you can see it more up close. It's quite large, it's about two and a half feet by six, seven feet, uh, actually nearly eight feet high. Um, oh, it's cutting me off for some reason, but at the bottom there, you, if you saw the two names of the two immigrant ancestors, um, the woman's name would be Lydia Leonard, and Leonard being an Irish name. So Lorraine actually discovered that their family had an Irish ancestor, which none of them had known. So we sometimes think as Mennonites that, oh, we just know our family trees backwards and forwards, but actually there are a lot of surprises there that can happen. And perhaps you have experienced surprises of your own, in your own family tree research. Um, I often hear stories of illegitimate births, secret adoptions, sometimes a family member who committed a serious crime, sometimes a branch of a family that is just dropped off completely and, and later rediscovered. There are, there are lots of stories there. And it's interesting again to look at genealogical values and how those have changed over time. I have here a genealogical manual um, from, from the early part of the last century. And in it, it says that Although it may be unsavory, record the truth. That is something unusual or, or disgraceful about your family. Record the truth, but avoid making it prominent. Don't go into detail about such matters. You will find plenty of other things to record of which you will be proud. But it's interesting how times have changed these days. Genealogical guides are more likely to encourage us to explore and even embrace the messiness of family life as a way of honoring the lives of those who lived before and uh, understanding our own place within the family system. And today, um, family tree makers have many options for doing that. I want to just conclude by showing you briefly a couple of other ways that fam the family messiness can get expressed. Here is a page from a family Bible, a fairly typical formulaic marriage page, but you'll notice that um, uh, someone has written in beside the names Josiah Oberholzer and Hannah Snyder, second wife. There's no place on the form for that kind of uh, notation, but they felt that very important to be there. Um, and they also included at the bottom uh, that 
just to make sure that people understand that this person was the son of Abraham and Sarah Erb Oberholzer. So there are ways in which we take very formulaic things and uh, shoehorn the information in that we feel is important. Here's another great example. This one's much older, um, from the late 1700s. Uh, a man named um, uh, Johannes or John Brubaker. Uh, and he has here filled out a form that was printed in Pennsylvania. Um, a lot of printers made their money doing this kind of thing, uh, printing out blank forms, maybe getting someone to color. But we can also see here that, although it might be hard to see on the picture, someone has also added some kind of frock door like um, uh, leaves at the top there, leaves and flowers at the top of the heart, and, and that is hand drawn. But you'll notice here, if we look down toward the bottom of the heart, that he was born in Cocalico Township, Lancaster County, North America, and the following words are crossed out. And it says um, in English, uh, he was baptized with the name, and that is crossed out. Um, of course, there's Mennonites, uh, infants were not baptized. So instead, it was written in, uh, in, in pen there, er heist Johannes Brubaker. So his name is Johannes. So here's a great example of how, as Mennonites, we have taken the common forms of family trees and we have, through art and through expression, made, uh, made them our own. So in conclusion, I'd just like to say that I hope you enjoyed this look at different family trees. Um, perhaps you have some family tree stories to share. We didn't even talk about some recent developments such as genetic testing, computer databases. There's all kinds of new things happening all the time in how families are depicted. So I guess if I would leave you with one question, it would be if you were to design a family tree of your own completely from scratch, if you had a completely free hand, how would you do it? Would you do it in the traditional way? Of course, what is the traditional way? Um, would you try something completely new? Would it even be a tree at all? Uh, something to think about. I think though, if there's one common th thread through all these images, it's that we have this strong desire to understand our family connections, not only to those who have gone before, but to those who are with us now. And we have, we imagine um, what, where the family tree might take us in the future. Um, thank you for listening. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Lorraine, that was excellent. So if you have a question, why don't you put it in the chat or in the Q&A section and Lorraine can answer it. I will read out the questions and then she will answer them verbally. I know Tina was wondering um, if at the, the one family tree that you showed with the ancestor in the middle, do you have a grandma number for that ancestor? Uh, for the center of Jansen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I do. I don't have it um, with me. Okay. Um, let me see. I should have known. I was thinking beforehand, oh, someone's going to ask me about grandma numbers. <laughs> um, I can give you his dates. That might help. Sure. Here. Uh, so, Johann or Hans Jansen, 1752 to 1823. And two wives, Maria Bergman and Agatha Fast. So maybe that will that will help you find them. Okay, excellent. And maybe you just want to, for those who don't know, want to say what a grandma number is <laughs> and how it helps. Sure. So there's again something else fascinating I could have talked talked about is the grandma database. This was started many years ago, and it's a genealogical database that is almost completely um, entered by volunteers. Um, just about anyone can sign up and enter data. And each time you enter a new person, they get assigned a number. Uh, and so that number helps you more precisely locate which, 
Lorreen Harder you're talking about, although I must say I am the only Lorreen Harder in there, so it makes it easier. But when you get names like John Jansen, um, very common names, it helps if everyone has a number. Look at this, Yo, um, M. Friesen says, Johan Johnson's grandma number is 45854. Tina, it's right there. Love this, that this community is happening here and people know there the you answers go. to this stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have a question here. Verna is asking, would it be easier or possibly more accurate since information can be verified more easily to start a family tree with yourself rather than a previous ancestor? She mm -hmm. says, we have some family books on my Mennonite heritage that we don't know how accurate the information is since there's no indication of where the information has come from. In some cases, information about my own family is inaccurate consequently. I don't know how much I could trust the other information that has been provided. Also, since I don't know the source information, I can't verify anything. What do you think? Right, right. And if I mentioned Lorraine Roth, she was the woman who did that third tree on the family blind who became this master genealogist. If she was here, the first thing she would say is start with what you know and what you can verify. So if that happens to be you and your parents, that's, that's a good place to start. Um, if you go to genealogical conferences, um, they are, I mean, I think they put some historians to shame for the, the amount they try to impress on people. Um, try, to, try your best to find those primary sources or at least copies of primary sources um, so that you, you really do know and, and cite those sources um, so you really do know. Um, there, there will come a point where it just kind of vanishes into history and for every family that will be a little different point. And I think, I think this comes down to the, the choices part. You have, you have choices at that point. You can kind of accept with some caveats what you've been given, even though they, the, the primary sources aren't completely cited. Um, you can also read back into the places and times where those people lived. So you might not get their actual names precisely, but you can definitely get a feel for the times and places in which they lived. And that can be a really rewarding experience um, as well. So those are, those are some of the ways you can, can get around those. Lorraine, can you say what kind of primary sources um, people might look for if they're trying to verify ancestors in their family trees? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just think, I'm just trying to think out loud here because I know there are many uh, different Mennonite groups have kind of different uh, go-to sources. Um, maybe I'll just say a little bit about the Ontario experience. So um, Mennonites first came to Ontario in, in 1786 or so, the first Mennonites to come to Canada. <laughs> Um, 1786 until about 1835, there are very few records. And there are certainly records because Mennonites were not allowed to officiate marriages until in Ontario until the mid 1830s, a dissenting church. So you had to be married by a justice of the peace or, or, um, or a, say a, a, your local Anglican priest had to marry you. So these are the kinds of interesting challenges we come up with in terms of Mennonite uh, genealogy. Um, in those cases, you have to try to look at government records which are, and Justice of the Peace records, which are somewhat sketchy. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is it often depends on the history of the particular group. Hmm. Uh, government records can be useful. Church records can be useful. Again, you run across the Mennonite habit of baptizing adults instead of children. So you, people coming to me with say an Anglican background, um, I have to explain that no, you're not gonna find the birth record necessarily. Of one. Um, there is a, a Mennonite uh, website in Canada called MennoniteGenealogy.com that is particularly good for Russian Mennonite um, church registers and so on. Uh, my website at the Mennonite Archives of Ontario deals somewhat with that, but also the Swiss and Amish Mennonite groups. And there are new sources coming up all the time. So um, we just, uh, 
we just try and keep um, keep on top of them. That's great. Uh, Kevin is asking, Kevin and Ann are asking, is the Johan Brubaker on the last slide related to John E. Brubaker from the Brubaker House in Waterloo? Absolutely, and that's one of the reasons I, I wanted to include that one in the exhibit mm -hmm. because of the direct relationship to Johnny e. Brubaker and Brubaker House. And if anyone saw my um, promo video for this series, we, we couldn't go into the archives and film there, so we tried to be creative and filmed in front of Brubaker House, which is a, a lovely place to visit if you ever have a chance. Nice. Erla is wondering, do you have much experience with genetic testing and do you recommend it? Personally, I have not done it. Um, I've, I've seen uh, results from various labs or companies that provide it uh, from different people. I'm not a scientist, uh, so I can only tell you what I've read as an archivist and librarian and that it very much depends on the company and their database, uh, how accurate your results might be. Um, and uh, science at that level often deals in probabilities. Um, so as much as we would like to, you know, learn for absolutely 100% certain that we had a certain ancestor who lived in a certain part of the world, um, that's very unlikely to, to happen, at least with where the technology is now. So I think it can be an interesting experience for people. I think I've also heard stories and I've had people come into the archives who suddenly discover that they have relatives that they didn't know they had, mm -hmm. which can be very exciting. It can also be very traumatic. So to some mm -hmm. extent, people have to be prepared for that happening. Right. Um, but, but if your curiosity leads you in that direction, um, sure, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. David says, Grandma Seven is wonderful. I've extracted 76,000 names associated with people whose descendants or living relatives have lived in the virtual Ontario area. Has such a separation been done for other groups or communities of Mennonites? So I, I missed the name of the place. Um, Virgil, Ontario. Oh, Virgil, okay. And he's talking about Grandma Seven. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with that? Yeah, like the latest version, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's, the question is... Have other um, specific locations um, been connected to people that way? I think he's asking. Has mm. such a separation been done for other groups or communities of that way? Hmm. So... I bet there's about 50 genealogists on the line right now who are just jumping up and down saying, I know the answer to that. <laughs> um, I'm afraid I don't. Is it, uh, who, who asked the question? Is it David, David Hemmings? Hemmings? Okay, yeah, I'm familiar with David's work uh, and his phenomenal work in, in the Virgil area. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I just don't know. And um, if anyone has information for David, I, I have his contact information. So if you want to email me, I'll make sure he gets it. Sure. If you know the answer to that question, feel free to put it in the chat. Community information sharing here. Mm -hmm. um, Ev is wondering how to write your personal or family history. If you don't do it, who will? By Katie Funk. Weed. She's recommending this book, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you say anything about that book? Well, I, I, I'll just mention, I did not talk about family memoirs specifically. That's a whole other area. And um, I was talking to our acquisitions librarian recently, and the way it works in the library world is there's kind of two very distinct places in the library where we put genealogies in one place we put family histories in the other place. And there are so many more books coming up now that, that, that mesh both. And I think that's partly to do with, with the way we're exploring our emotional connection to our family histories, not just knowing the bloodlines, but understanding um, where we came from um, in, in an emotional way. So, uh, so yeah, I, um, I did a, one of my favorite that was one of my favorite topics when I was doing my master's degree is is 
reading those Mennonite family memoirs. Um, and there's more and more coming out all the time. They're, they're really wonderful. That's great. Um, so we have somebody here saying, Kevin is, and Anne are saying, one primary source that came down through my family was the Johnny e. Boo Baker's copy book. This had in his own hand, both school and farm records. I donated it to Conrad Grable through my colleague, mm -hmm. Mandy McAfee. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. I remember when that came in, it was delightful to see, uh, seeing something in someone's own handwriting is, mm -hmm is uh, I think a special experience for a lot of people who come to the archives. That's great. Then we have a question. Oh, no, got that one. Is there a grandma equivalent for Swiss Mennonite names? Hmm. So if you are from Waterloo region, very specifically, there is something called Ezra E.B. Revived, based on Ezra E.B.'s Biographical History of Waterloo Township, which is kind of like the Bible of, of Waterloo region Mennonite genealogy. Um, there is in, I'm trying to remember the name, Saga, Swiss Anabaptist, Genealogical Association, I believe, located in the in the American Wood, American Wood Midwest. Um, they have quite a large database as well. I have, I don't have a lot of experience um, um, searching in that particular one, but I understand it's quite uh, substantial. I'll I'll mention that that we at Conrad Grable in the library we try to collect every genealogy we can, particularly of Canadian families, but because the families are so intertwined, often North American families as well. So if you've got a genealogy, an extra copy, and we don't have it, uh, we love it when that happens, and uh, we we'd love to get a copy. It's not online in the same way, but again, it's it's another way to kind of verify what you're learning online. And if you uncover secrets in your family, example, adopted versus biological children, etc., what is your responsibility to the person who has passed away and may never have shared it versus wanting to share this with others in your family because it clarifies some things? Have you ever had sure. to deal with that or witness mm -hmm. that kind of thing? That's a great question. And like I said, over time, attitudes to that have, has cha have changed. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and this is where the choice part comes in, the design. Um, people will handle this in different ways. Sometimes it will be very discreet notations. Other times it might be the center of the story. Um, I'll just tell you, uh, I'll give you a little example. So I received this genealogy from a woman who, it was actually her husband's family. This is another thing. You often find women doing uh, genealogies of their husband's families. It's an, I find that fascinating. Um, but uh, she wrote me this lovely letter and just said, I really wanted to have this um, uh, genealogy of my husband published. And by the way, my husband, um, this is his family circumstance. His, his mother was actually his aunt. And, and she told me the whole story in the letter. And it's only because she told me that whole story so explicitly that I was able to open the genealogy. And it took me a while, but I was able to piece together the story she had just told me. Sure. So it was discreet, I think, and, and reverential to, to the people involved, but she was also telling the truth. And I think it really depends on the family and, and you and where you're at and how comfortable you are with that. But there's there's always a way um, way to tell the stories. And if I had to kind of declare a bias, I would say that I think the more we know about our ancestors, the more we can relate to them as individuals and human beings, um, the, be the better it is um, for the family and, and for us to kind of honor their lived experience through understanding what truly happened to them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's, that's a good answer. 
Do you foresee, Carolyn is wondering, do you foresee the archives making appointments to use the reading room during COVID-19? She says, mm. hopeful thinking. <laughs> I sincerely hope so. Um, we are bound as everyone else is by the um by the science and and by our local health authorities and so on um the way i envision it happening is uh i just tell everyone just keep watching our website it's probably not going to happen for the next few weeks eventually however i hope there's some kind of accommodation uh it would probably be by appointment only especially at first um there's a fair bit of science that is starting to tell us that there are safe ways to quarantine archival materials. And if that science keeps along that course, then I feel more confident that we can share our materials and, and do it safely. Okay, excellent. Erica is wondering, is privacy legislation an issue for you in reference to MADE, CBOC records, which I can no longer find on the internet, or even GMAL? An uncle of mine from Germany is no longer submitting info to Gmail grandma due to German privacy rules. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about that? Mm -hmm. Oh, privacy law, that's a whole <laughs> And with these, these uh, databases that cross national boundaries, um, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's like the technology has far out, outstripped the law in many regards. Okay. I think that um, I can't answer for all archivists and all archives because we have to some extent taken different approaches to this. Um, hmm. I think, I, I think um, there's the basics of the law and there's also kind of a, a broader are, you want to cultivate respect and you want to cultivate the opportunity for people to um, not have their information known if they don't want it. Mm. At the same time, your information is never just your information. There's always genealogy. Right. There's always someone else connected to your information. So, mm. so there are ways that we can deal with restrictions uh, on a kind of a case by case basis. Uh, trying to obey the laws as we understand them and and trying to be respectful to all sides and and that's uh, that's that's what we try to do okay and Karen is asking what's the difference between using the Mennonite genealogy source and ancestry.com hmm. I don't have a lot of experience with ancestry directly um, I think what you have to ultimately look at is is what are the sources that are cited how well are they cited and if the sources are good then it it probably doesn't matter if the sources are are bad then <laughs> um then they're less reliable so um and it's always good to maybe try both uh try mm -hmm. grandma try ancestry um another one that i really like to go to especially because it has a lot of uh, Ontario civil records, is um, the familysearch.org. Um, and because it, again, it will take you directly to scans of the, of the original documents. Mm -hmm. So the more you can get close to understanding what those primary sources say, the, the more, um, the better it is. Rhonda brings up a point. She says, when you find an error in a database that you know for a fact is an error, how do you handle this to have it corrected? I think it's a sign of a good database that they have a mechanism for that. Mm. Uh, I don't know if she is referring to a specific database, but but normally uh, there there should be there should be somewhere in the database if it's a good one. There should be a way to contact someone to. To, to verify that a change needs to be made. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Carol says, the Oxford notes of 1924 describe immigration to Ontario and Manitoba. Do we have good information prior to that from Ukraine? So do we have good records from Mennonites living in Ukraine in Imperial? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I would, I would again 
go to kind of mennightgenealogy.com um, and uh, there is a whole section there on Russia and various other um, parts of that world and I'm sure there's there's a Russian Mennite genealogist right now jumping up and down saying you didn't mention this or that source uh, but that would be the place I would start. Okay. Uh, Ev is wondering if you can repeat the Ontario source. You mentioned a few things and I will send out some links in the follow-up email. You said the Ezra Eby one, not specifically Kitchener. Right, Waterloo Region would be Ezra, E-Z-R-A, E-B, E-B-Y, uh, Ezra E-B revived.com. So that's done by a genealogist named Alan Detweiler, and what he has done is taken the Ezra E.B., the two-volume history by Ezra E.B., which was done in the 1890s, um, and, uh, and he's put that database online, and he had, has continued to update. I think he's, he's finally uh, finished now, but he has continued to update that for decades. It's, it's not perfect. Um, sometimes sources are cited, sometimes they're not, you know, but uh, on the whole, it's not a bad place to start if you're looking for Ontario uh, Swiss genealogy. Okay. And the, our, students, uh, our students at Conrad Grable will use it to figure out if they're related before they start dating. That's good, that's wise. You said uh, another Ontario source was thefamilysearch.org. Yeah, um, familysearch.org is actually, um, it, it was started originally by the Mormon Family History Center. I think it's an independent organization now. Okay. Uh, so they have records from all over the world. Um, the on archives of Ontario, so our, our provincial state archives, essentially, um, has partnered with them and so uh, birth records, death records, marriage records up to a certain point, so kind of mid 19th century up to the early 20th century are, are on there. Census records as well, so you can, you can cross uh, search census records. Okay, that's great. Um, Verna is saying sometimes if there's no image possible on familysearch.org, you can find an image on ancestry.com. And somebody else mentioned, I found actual death certificates in Ancestry.com and other original documents that are very helpful. Mm -hmm. Great. Just like, a caution for some Russian Mennonites. I was looking at members of my own family on Family Search, and the transcriptions were clearly done by someone who didn't know Russian Mennonite names very well. So oh. you just have to be persistent, try a few different things before things emerge. Because things were spelled incorrectly or? Yeah, okay. Excellent. I think we're wrapping up here unless anybody else has one final question or any last thing to say. Anybody have? Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Lorraine. That was fascinating. It was neat to see how different people represent their family trees and I'm sure you've sparked several people thinking, oh, I think I want to make a family tree or record my family history somehow. And we will be sending out um, a follow-up email with um, links to some of the resources that Lorene has mentioned, as well as link to um, her organization and an opportunity to give if you'd like to express your appreciation for the presentation this evening or any of the other presentations. And you're getting lots of thank yous, uh, Lorraine. So um, thanks again and thank you everyone for coming and for joining us for this series. I don't know what you're gonna do with your Tuesday nights now. We'll have to uh, see you again in the fall. All right, good night everyone. Good night.